Today we're going to talk about building a Subaru EJ engine. EJ engines are a little bit tricky because probably if you're in the Subarus, you know about their penchant to blow up. So we're going to try to make an engine that doesn't do that, that can take a lot of power reliably and run really good. Uh, this engine should work really good for the track or the street. And we're going to take an innovative approach. Now, usually everybody builds the STI EJ257 2.5 liter engine. But the other day, we're driving a regular 2 liter WRX, and, and um, we noticed how smooth it was and how uh, eager it was to rev. So we were thinking, wow, if you could build something with decent torque, like a EJ257, but with the free revving of the 2 liter, that might be pretty cool. So we're kind of building this uh, Stroker EJ205, and we want to have um, some of the torque of the uh, 2.5 liter, but we want to keep the high revving uh, smoothness and uh, liveliness of the 2 liter. So let's see how we're doing it. To build a high power engine, it has to breathe. So anytime you build an engine, a lot of the power generating capability centers around the cylinder head and this Subaru engine was no exception. So what we did is we got the um, two, 205 heads and we had them uh, CNC ported. Um, the porting kind of finished off the uh, uh, combustion chamber a little bit, did a light bit of unshrouding around the edges of the chamber. Uh, if you look at the intake and exhaust ports, you can see a five axis CNC machine went in there, opened them up and uh, kind of cleaned them up, took out all the sharp radiuses, especially uh, where a lot of flow can be gained is in the pocket area of right into the valve. So the short side radius is all nice and cleaned up and blended, no sharp edges and the valve seats are blended into the bowl of the port. Uh, this is where you could pick up a lot of horsepower. Uh, another thing we did is we had a, our valve job done with a new and CNC machine. So unlike a regular valve job, this actually uses a CNC machine to cut a continuous radius from the uh, combustion chamber into the port. So instead of uh, doing like a three angle valve job with like cutters or stones, uh, where you have your chamber cut, your valve seating 45 degree surface and the 70 degree throat cut, it's one smooth radius with a 45 degree seat. And this is the best way to get flow. And the new and valve job actually picks up quite a bit of power over a regular valve job. It's kind of hard to see on video, but it's actually really neat. It's one smooth blend. Now, of course, to uh, get more flow, you need to have uh, valves that are capable of it. So uh, we use Supertech intake and exhaust valves. The exhaust valve is made out of Inconel. This is a semi-exotic engineering alloy that's um, capable of taking a lot of heat, so that's critical in the turbo motor. This contour is kind of more straight up and down, so uh, the uh, flow going out of the, uh, out of the uh, cylinder can take a smoother turn going into the exhaust port, so this shape actually picks up flow over the stock valve. The intake valve is made out of nitrided stainless steel, um, it has what you call a tulip profile, so it's kind of flat. Uh, this kind of helps the flow going into the combustion chamber. And you also notice that the stem is turned down. This turned down stem actually picks up um, maybe eight to 10% of the flow because it's smaller diameter and blocks less area. Now, you notice the exhaust valve doesn't have that. It would be nice, but the exhaust valve always has to dissipate heat like out of the uh, combustion chamber because the head gets really hot. So to conduct the heat, um, this part of the stem is not taken down. Now some naturally aspirated motors also have a reduced stem on the exhaust side, but to be conservative, uh, we did not specify that. Uh, for long life, 
Um, our valves were cryogenically treated uh, by CTP cryogenics, and we also WPC treated the uh, valves, particularly the stems. Uh, WPC is a Japanese uh, metal treatment process that gives a really hard, smooth, lubricious uh, surface finish that wears really well. Um, even though like the stem is nitrided, uh, you could still WPC over nitriding and it still works. Um, WPC also does not change any dimensions, so you don't have any problem with your valve to guide clearance or anything after treatment. Another critical part is um, the camshaft. Now, um, since this is a pretty, uh, it's going to be a pretty solid um, performance motor, so we're using a relatively uh, radical cam. It's a Kelford uh, 199K series cam. The, the K series cam has the intake duration of 272 degrees, an exhaust duration of 268, and uh, 11.5 millimeters of intake lift and 10.5 millimeters of exhaust lift. Now this isn't um, the most radical EJ cam that Kelford makes, but one thing you got to be careful when you're doing a, a small displacement motor, um, like under 2.5 liters, you have to be careful not to overcam the engine because overcamming creates like a really narrow power band and uh, poor running characteristics at low RPM. So uh, since this engine, even though it's trackable, it also has to be decent on the street. We didn't want to go too much with too much overlap or um, too much duration because that really kills the bottom end. Um, this cam is kind of um, short, shorter duration, high lift, and that usually generates uh, a broader power band with decent torque. Um, one thing about a short duration and a high lift is it creates pretty aggressive valve motion and that has to be controlled. So of course we had to go with stiffer valve springs. Now this is a Kelford valve spring and it's uh, tailored for this cam. Uh, some cool things about this spring is um, it's a beehive spring. So what you, what you notice, it's kind of hard to tell on video, but it's kind of shaped like a beehive. Um, this, the beehive shape has some advantages, like it can uh, be compressed more. And because the beehive kind of collapses on itself, uh, the spring can have more lift before it goes into coil bind. Um, the other advantage is since the beehive is smaller on the top, you can run a uh, smaller keeper. The smaller keeper is lighter, so less uh, reciprocating weight. So that's an advantage to avoid valve float. And the last advantage of a beehive spring is that since it's a regular shape, um, it's not as likely to have problems with spring surge due to like high order harmonics. Um, you usually have to look out for surge with maybe fifth order harmonics, which is uh, at high RPMs. Um, these kind of harmonics at high RPMs, the forces are pretty low, but at high RPM, the forces could build up and cause spring surge, which uh, you would perceive as valve float. So the beehive sh shape kind of resists that. Uh, small keeper is good uh, for durability because um, valve springs fatigue and break. Uh, we had CTP cryogenics cryogenically treat our springs and we also had them WPC treated um, both the spring and the retainer. Uh, WPC treatment usually really increases the fatigue strength of a spring probably by about a hundred percent. Also, uh, it helps the retainers because um, valves rotate as the engine runs. So the keepers are always kind of turning on the in inside of the retainer. And uh, the retainer kind of turns on the spring. And, and in high performance engines, uh, usually that's a wear factor that you always have to be careful. Like if they wear out too much, the uh, keepers start sinking in the retainers and the retainer starts popping up, you lose installed height, you lose spring tension, uh, it gets sloppy, you can end up dropping a valve. So um, all good things, uh, good for reliability there. 
When we're talking about valve train, one of the problems with the EJ is the timing belt guide breaks. So IAG makes a heavy duty built one, uh, solid aluminum, won't break. Another IAG part they're running is their TGV valve delete. Um, the stock engine has these things called TGV valves that are in the intake manifold and they open and close and they impart a swirl into the intake flow. Now this is for emissions purposes and it actually kind of hampers low end power development and it also isn't good for top end power. It's also a thing that can break and um, you don't want to have that so these completely remove the uh, TG, TGV system and uh, it's a nice clean thing like uh, I know in our car we actually took them out and we welded up the holes on the stock one. This is a lot easier to do than that. So part of developing a reliable Subaru engine is modifying the case. The case is one of the weak points of the Subaru engine. When uh, you pick it up, it's uh, really light. And this light little piece of aluminum contains a lot of violence. And uh, when you start approaching 500 horsepower, the whole thing starts flexing and losing integrity and uh, you start getting bearing wear and um, you know like other problems like head sealing like the whole thing starts flexing apart uh, this wear is bad on the crankshaft bad on all the reciprocating points and it's hard to maintain head gasket seal uh, so what we did is we set our cases out to out front motorsports uh, and they did their closed deck conversion so what they do is they put the, the case of the CNC machine and they machine out the uh, open deck part of the block so their own insert, which is also a CNC piece of billet aluminum, can be pressed in there. It presses in at a light interference fit and you can see like how perfect the fit is. Like you can't even see any gaps and maybe it's a slightly different color. Uh, they press it in and then they... Uh, deck the block so it's perfectly flat. Um, after they do this, um, what they'll do is a line bore the case and they'll do the finished machining of the bore um, in the fixture. Uh, like Subaru uh, cases are really flimsy so when you bolt on the cylinder heads and actually bolt them together, they distort and that distorts the uh, bearing boards It also distorts the uh, cylinder bores. Now the dis distortion can be really extreme, like almost two thousandths of an inch. So if you don't use uh, fixtures uh, and you just go to like your machine shop and have your have your cases board, uh, when you assemble the engine, uh, if if your um, cylinder walls are distorted like one and a half to two thousandths, uh, you're going to have a hard time getting your rings to seal. Uh, you're going to get cylinder wall scuffing and all kinds of stuff. Uh, this is where those rumors that you hear that uh, a Subaru engine can't be rebuilt by anyone other than the factory come from. Um, now when you get <clears throat> when you get a Subaru uh, short block from the factory, sure it's all it's all good, just like the factory, but it's kind of a myth. Uh, you can do a good Subaru engine, uh, just you need the fixtures. So. Uh, how the, the block is machined, there's a, um, a plate that simulates the cylinder head and there's also a plate that simulates the other case. Now it's all bolted together and torqued down to uh, the right specs and this pre-distorts the, um, the cylinder walls so uh, the cylinder can be bored and honed uh, to the exact same dimensions that will be with the head and the other case half bolted on. Um, this gives you a nice, accurate uh, bore when assembled. And Subarus have to be done this way, like a lot of machine shops don't, and that's why a lot of your built Subaru engines have a short life, don't work all that great, and die real quick. Now, after this, uh, the case halves are, um, are kind of uh, surfaced on the uh, parting side right here. They're bolted together, and then uh, the uh, torque plates are, are also bolted on and uh, the uh, cases are a line board. 
So a line boring uh, with all this uh, uh, pre-bolted on stress will make sure that your bearing bores are round um, and lined up straight when, they're, when the engine's assembled. That way it's not all tweaking and you get weird wear patterns. Um, another thing is uh, while, while everything was being machined, um, the uh, holes were reamed out and re-threaded to uh, run heavy-duty studs and heavy-duty case bolts. Now, uh, these are important to keep uh, the, the flexing Subaru together at higher horsepower. So we went up um, a millimeter in stud size and we're going to run more torque. Of course, all the fixturing was done to the new higher torque level so we get the same amount of distortion. Um, this stuff really helps hold the engine together when you're running higher boost and uh, uh, really helps your reliability. Your bearing wear and everything is a lot better. Your cylinder sealing is a lot better. Um, also, a touch that was done is the uh, water jackets were ported out to exactly match the head gasket and, and exactly match the water passages in the head. This lets uh, coolant flow between the head and the block better. And um, the oil passage from the oil pump to the uh, filter boss was also ported. Uh, this helps uh, you know, oil, oil from your uh, pump to your filter have less restriction. Uh, like oiling these engines are kind of a problem and little details like this uh, really help. So um, that helps with the, a big headache of the Subaru is keeping the, the block together. If we were to go for even more horsepower, like maybe over 600, uh, we would also probably dowel pin um, in, the, in the bearing area. And if we're doing a, a 2.5 liter with its more stroke and more stress, we would also do that. Uh, but we didn't do that in this particular engine, but if uh, it was going to be a higher boost, higher power application, we would have done that extra step. Um, another thing we did is to, to preserve the free, uh, free revving feel of the engine is we're running a longer connecting rod than stock. It's 132.9 millimeters long. That's longer than the stock, uh, stock rod, which is 130.5 millimeters. Um, what the longer rod does is it um, slows your accel piston acceleration down from TDC and it kind of reduces your mean piston speed. Um, some of the things that you get from that is um, when you're accelerating the rod from TDC that puts a lot of tensile stress, stress on your rod bolts um, and your crank. Uh, that's additional stress. Um, when the piston is in the region of um, top dead center, uh, like a short rod puts a lot of thrust load on the piston. So the piston wants to dig into the cylinder wall. A longer rod reduces the thrust load and it reduces your friction. And the longer rod actually spends more dwell time at uh, around TDC. So that actually gives you a little bit more time to fill the cylinders, which improves your volumetric efficiency it also lets the explosion impinge on the piston dome a little bit longer. So that pr improves your thermal p um, efficiency potentially. Now this is a little bit hard to prove on the dyno. Uh, like we've dyed long rod and short rod motors and uh, they're not that different a lot of the times, but the feel of the engine while you're actually driving it is pretty different. Um, the engine, with a long rod feels a lot smoother. It feels a lot more happy to rev and um, it even sounds a lot different. It sounds smoother and less thrashy when you have a long rod. So some of this stuff doesn't pick up on the dyno, but it's a different, definite characteristic you can feel when driving the car. Um, now, probably all of us have experienced engines that are like thrashy. You rev them to a certain point and they kind of scream and um, you know, they sound kind of badass and crazy, but it also sounds like they're right on the edge and they're, you know, like psychologically you're thinking, oh man, it's close to blowing up. But like a long rod engine kind of just 
smoothly revs up there and kind of shrieks instead of screams. So I guess it's kind of like the difference between hearing like an IndyCar engine and a NASCAR engine or something. It's kind of an exaggeration, but uh, you can definitely hear and feel the difference when driving a long rod motor and uh, it definitely puts less stress on the internal components. This Eagle Rod is made out of 4340 chrome moly. Now this is a higher nickel, um, higher chromium content uh, steel than your typical 4130 chrome moly that you kind of find in your frame or things like that. Um, the higher nickel and chromium content makes the metal uh, tougher and more impact and fatigue resistant. So the metal itself is way better than what you find in your uh, stock rod. Uh, it's also better than a lot of stuff that's in the aftermarket. Uh, we're using Eagle's heavy duty version uh, um, of the EJ rod. And um, this uses a ARP custom age 625 bolt. Uh, this is ARP's top of the line rod bolt and it's uh, almost 50% stronger than the ARP 2000 bolt that's typical in most rods. Uh, since this is going to be a high revving engine with a decent amount of boost, we want it the best. And uh, we use 625 bolts in like all our really serious engines and um, this rod is no exception. In addition to the 625 custom made rod bolts, we've done an additional step. We uh, take the bolts out and we have the bolts cryo treated, then WPC treated uh, before reassembling. That way the shanks and all the threads and everything are WPC'd. Um, this gives the rod bolts more fatigue strength, which is critical. Uh, the rod bolts are probably the highest stress part in the engine. And generally when you have a catastrophic engine failure, the most common thing that causes this is a rod bolt failure. So it's an extra precaution we take to um, help the rod bolts out as much as they can. The Eagle Rod is an H profile. I usually like H profiles because they place more material uh, in the area of bending stress. Um, it's just my preference. They also have like a little feature rib that's inside here. And, and uh, through finite element analysis, they found that this rib actually increases uh, both ten tensile and fatigue strength quite a bit without very much weight penalty. Um, has a silicon bronze uh, pin with uh, double oilers. A lot of rods only have single oilers. And the oilers are at the bottom part here, which is actually a good place to put them. A lot of rods put the oiler on the top, but the top is the most highly stressed part of the rod from the piston pin. And when you're putting an oiler hole there, you're actually weakening that area quite a bit. So you can see the oiler holes are on the side where they don't weaken the rod as much. Um, to accommodate the long rod, we're using a, a custom JE piston. Um, now this is the a JE FRS forging. Uh, you can see it's a strut type forging, which means um, there's no excess material anywhere that you don't need it for uh, support of the piston pin or support of the uh, skirts. Um, the FRS is really lightweight. And uh, JE just came out with a new uh, forging method where their forging dies are closer to net shape. So you get good grain flow all around the piston, like right where you need it. And this makes for a more homogeneous, uh, stronger piston that doesn't weigh anymore. So it's JE's new forging technology. Well, it's not that new. They've been doing it for about a year or more. Um, one of the uh, really interesting things is uh, you see how the piston pin goes way up into the oil ring groove. Um, we did this to accommodate the uh, longer rod. So the oil ring is actually kind of unsupported for this little distance. Now that might seem kind of crazy, but uh, you know we've done this on quite a few different engines and we haven't even noticed uh, any kind of bad effects. So this piston is 8.5 to one compression. Now you can see it's a low compression piston by the dish and it's 93 millimeters in bore. That's up from the stock 92 millimeter bore. 
So when you bore and stroke the engine, the displacement ends up being 2255 cc's. So you do all this boring and stroking, it's partway to an EJ, almost halfway there. Uh, we think that this will give us a nice boost in torque, help the engine uh, spool better, help the engine tolerate a bigger cam, and uh, maybe it won't have the grunt of the EJ, but I, we think it'll still rev nice and freely like a, like a two liter will. It'll be really cool. The uh, number one compression ring is um, it's 0.8 millimeters and it's uh, hard nitride at low tension. The uh, number two compression ring is um, iron and it has a Dykes profile and it's 1.2 millimeters. It's also uh, low tension. Uh, the, it has a Naper profile. What a Naper profile is, is the face of the ring has kind of like a hook and the hook actually kind of helps the uh, ring seat in quicker. It's that little edge that will break into the cylinder really quick and also tends to scrape any oil that gets past the oil rings off the cylinder walls. So it's really good as a second ring. Uh, the little Naper hook also like pushes pretty hard into the cylinder wall so because um, it has less surface area. So even though the tension is low, the, the sealing is still really good and the friction is low. Um, the nitriding on the number one ring um, makes it really hard and wear resistant and the iron of the second ring kind of breaks in quick so it's the best of both worlds. Um, we WPC treated the piston to kind of harden it up and make it super slippery. Uh, it's really smooth and satiny. The surface is hardened um, up to about uh, four tenths down into the metal. Um, it's really hard, wear resistant, low friction. Uh, also the WPC treatment gets into the ring grooves and uh, makes them super hard and slippery so you're less likely to get micro welding between the ring and the piston. Uh, this, this helps like ring seal under super high boost and long term life of these parts. Uh, the rings were also WPC treated which uh, greatly helps their life. Uh, we usually find that it improves ring life up to 50%. And to top it all off, the um, pistons, rings, piston pins, and um, rods are all not only WPC treated, but uh, also have been cryogenically treated by uh, CTP cryogenics. Actually, we um, WPC'd and um, cryogenically treated the crankshaft also. So um, I guess we got to talk about cryogenics at this point. Uh, cryogenics is sort of something that, you know, like seems like snake oil, but uh, when you look at it from the scientific viewpoint, it's actually not. Um, you got to kind of think of cryogenics as an extension of the heat treating process. Um, it involves um, taking the part down to like uh, the, about the temperature of liquid nitrogen slowly and bringing it back up to temperature and kind of cycling it back and forth like this over the period of um, several days. Now what this does, um, just to be short, is it converts a lot of austenite in uh, ferrous metal to martensite. Uh, martensite is a kind of a harder iron or steel molecule, I guess, just to put it very simply, harder and more wear resistant. Um, so you get your durability from that. Also, uh, the, the thermal cycling removes all, all the internal stress uh, caused by manufacturing of the part and stress relieves it really well. Um, you combine that with WPC and you have a part that can um, easily take twice as many cycles before failure uh, you also have a part that the surface is slipperier, smoother, and significantly longer wearing. So um, on a lot of our critical engines, we usually recommend both WPC and cryotreating. Um, I could talk a lot more about cryotreat, but then that's probably going to be the subject of another video. Um, it gets way into metallurgy, and um, yeah, we don't want to get totally into that for this. but. Uh, Let's just say it works and it's something we can do.
Um, so the JE piston pins we're running are uh, for a turbo motor. So they're a little bit longer than you would, would have for a naturally aspirated engine. So they engage more bearing area in the piston. Uh, this makes them less likely to flex. And we also run like a thicker wall uh, section than you typically find in a naturally aspirated motor. Uh, turbo motor doesn't need to rev as high, so um, you don't have to get every little gram out of the reciprocating parts, and it's better to make these uh, tough. Uh, one of the reasons is um, a, a turbo motor has way more cylinder pressure. It uh, actually can flex the piston pin, which makes the piston pin kind of seize in the small end of the rod and it can spin the bushing out. If that happens, everything starts to eat into each other and the small end of the rod or the piston pin fails or the pin boss of the piston fails and there goes your motor. So um, it's one of the reasons why we use a thicker pin on turbo motors. Now here's where kind of the cool stuff is for, for power production. Uh, we wanted to get more displacement to get some torque, but we also wanted to keep the free revvingness of the engine. Um, so the heart of that is this uh, Eagle crank. The Eagle crank has an 83 millimeter stroke. That's up from the stock 75 millimeter. Now this seems like a huge jump in stroke and, and uh, really stroking a motor that much typically makes an engine um, Less, less happy to rev and all that, but when you look at 83 millimeters uh, for a two point something liter engine, it's really not that extreme. Uh, for instance, that's a shorter stroke than just about any popular performance engine. Um, you know, it's shorter than a uh, K20A, for example, Honda. It's a shorter stroke than an SR20 Nissan. It's a shorter stroke than the B18C Honda. So the stroke to bore ratio is still pretty con conducive for high revs. In addition to having a longer stroke, the Eagle crank is uh, made from a 4340 chromoly forging. Uh, just like the rods, 4340 is a high nickel, high chromium alloy that's stronger and tougher than your traditional uh, steel. And uh, a lot of the uh, lesser alloys that they sometimes use for aftermarket cranks. Um, you could see that the crank has generous radiuses um, at the journals. These radiuses here are, are critical for fatigue strength and um, they really help take, uh, increase the number of cycles that the crank could take without uh, failing. Another trick that um, is done to the crank is you probably notice this teardrop profiling on the um, main bearing oil holes. Now what that does is it acts like a little reservoir to help uh, spread the oil film on the bearing. It also gives you a little bit more dwell time to uh, build up the oil film uh, as the crank spins around. So it's a cool little trick. Um, if a crank doesn't have this, we normally hand do it, but it comes this way from Eagle, so we don't have to mess around with it. Um, we also got uh, Eagle's optional ESP armor treatment to the crank. Now this is a uh, surface treatment where the crank is isentropically polished. Um, it's a combination of electric, electrical and chemical kind of reverse plating that leaves an ultra smooth surface. Uh, when you feel the ESP armor, I mean, it's like super slick. It's almost kind of crazy and has this kind of chrome look to it. Um, what this does is it removes any kind of area where a crack could propagate, uh, like micro cracks, so it greatly improves your fatigue strength, um, generally about 100% over a non-treated crank, which seems pretty crazy. Um, and also, this like super smooth surface reduces uh, frictional loss on the journals. It also reduces uh, windage drag as the crank spins around and cuts through the oil cloud that's flying around the crankcase. Um, it's really common on a, like a big V8 engine where they have a lot of data where ESP armor picks up like seven to 10 horsepower just from this frictional reduction. Not sure what it'll do in, this, in the four cylinder, but it'll probably give you at least a couple of horsepower, but 
We're more interested in the increases in durability that uh, ESP Armor offers. And to top it off, on top of that, um, we also WPC treated and cryogenically treated this crank as well. So I don't think fatigue is going to be so much of an issue with this crank, um, but it has like every prep trick we know done to it. So have a lot of confidence in this guy. While we're talking about the reciprocating parts of the motor, we're going to be getting rid of the stock harmonic balancer and adding a uh, fluid damper. Uh, for a lot of our big horsepower builds, we prefer to use the fluid damper. Um, now inside this housing, you have a weighted ring that spins around in a viscous silicone fluid. Um, now, like a regular harmonic balancer has a weight that's connected to the crank uh, hub. So when the crank's getting a lot of torsional whip, the, um, the weight of the, of the ring is tuned to where it helps attenuate some of that vibration that uh, during its critical peaks, like uh, due to har harmonics. So it helps attenuate a lot of the crank whip. What's not as good about a stock type balancer is the rubber is subjected to like high cycle shear forces all the time and breaks down with age. So your tuning gets off as the damper ages. And also this kind of tune um, damper is only kind of, it only works at a certain narrow RPM range where the weight is tuned for the vibration. Now the fluid damper spinning around freely in silicone fluid is way more consistent. There's no rubber to break down or, or shear. Um, when the ring is not constrained, uh, the damper is more amplitude sensitive than frequency sensitive. So the more the whip in the crank, the more it's gonna provide a damping force to damp out that, that whip. Um, this means that it works over a wider RPM range and it's kind of more forgiving and it's not so dependent on the, uh, the tune of the ring. Um, because th these things work so good over such a wide range, um, we like to use them whenever there's an application when we have a big power engine. And you can really feel the difference. On, on some engines, you even pick up some horsepower because uh, like, let's say you have a crank trigger ignition. If you can reduce the amount of whip in the crank, um, you're actually going to get way more accurate timing over the entire RPM range. Um, and also when the crank is not flexing and whipping around, you have a reduction in friction. Um, on, on some engines, we've actually measured an increase of power. Sometimes it could be as much as 12 horsepower. We've uh, measured with a fluid damper. Um, on my personal EJ, my 2.5 liter, I have a fluid damper. To be honest, we didn't measure any power gain on the dyno, but driving the car around, I could tell that it's a lot smoother. Like the vibrations are almost totally eliminated from the engine. You can really feel it, even with uh, performance motor mounts. And the also, also the engine even sounds a little different and, and revs a little bit more freely. The dyno didn't pick it up, but it's a feel thing. And I'm sure reducing those vibrations is uh, going to help my engine live longer. For engine bearings, uh, we're running uh, King's XP bearings. We've had really good luck with King bearings. Uh, the XP's are a really hard material. Uh, they have like a copper matrix. Uh, it's, it's like a tri-metal type bearing. And the main load bearing part um, has a lot of copper, so it's really hard. So it has a lot of load co bearing capacity before it squishes out. The copper also helps conduct heat out of the bearing surface a lot better because of copper's high thermal conductivity. And uh, the new thing is the latest uh, XP bearings have a uh, copper nanoparticle um, coating on the top layer. And uh, a lot of these uh, bearing coatings that we've run into are kind of like a dry film lube and they kind of wear off kind of quick, but they kind of help the, uh, protect the main bearing and they're a good thing. But uh, with King, the, the coating actually increases the bearing's load bearing capacity and it's kind of like hard and it stays there. 
Uh, we've taken engines apart after more than one hard racing season and the black is still there. Normally if it's just like a uh, organic resin coating, the black is usually almost all gone, but with the king bearings, it's still there. Um, we've used king bearings in really severe conditions like uh, for a thousand plus horsepower formula drift engines running ethanol. And if you know ethanol, it really dilutes the oil really quick and uh, oil shears down, it doesn't lubricate so good. But even after more than a season, the king bearings still look pretty decent after we take the engine apart. And most bearings typically look pretty haggard after that kind of use, even the best bearings. So we really like King and we use them on just about all our engine builds where there's an application for them. Uh, while we're talking about all this, uh, lubrication of your bearings and all your reciprocating parts is really critical. Um, so we're running a larger oil pump. This is a um, EJ OEM pump from a JDM engine. Uh, it has 11 millimeter gears versus the stock gears, which are 10 millimeter. So it's about a 50% uh, increase in oil volume over stock. Um, as another precaution, um, we WPC treated the oil pump gears and we cryo treated them. Uh, oil pump gear failure is a really common way that engines blow up, um, especially stroked engines. So uh, the WPC and cryo probably increase the fatigue strength of the gear, probably about 100%. And also it reduces the friction and it reduces the heat that get put, gets put in the oil. Um, we also WPC treated the pressure relief valve, the pressure relief bore, and the inside of the housing all to reduce friction. Uh, it's not like a big power thing, but it really helps reliability. And, um, uh, you know, reliability is always good. It doesn't cost too much to do that. Uh, the final thing we're doing is uh, EJs have like a lot of problems with the oiling, like actually any uh, flat motor does. When you uh, corner, the oil tends to go, um, as it sloshes up under G loads, it tends to go up into the cylinder heads. Any flat motor from a VW to a Porsche to a Subaru uh, always has problems with crankcase ventilation and air oil separation and spitting oil out the breathers. So it's not just a Subaru thing, it's like a flat motor thing. Um, so to prevent any oiling problems, uh, we were running a Killer V oil pan. Now this has, um, I think it's about one and a half quarts more capacity. It, it's deeper than the stock pan. Um, as you can see, it has baffling here. Um, these baffles keep the oil like in the pan and, and keep it from sloshing up into the top end. It also keeps the oil away from the crank and away from getting pounded around by the pistons. Um, another thing we're running is uh, the Killer Bee windage tray. The, the windage tray scrapes oil off the spinning uh, reciprocating assembly uh, with these uh, close tolerance scrapers and these one-way louvers. Uh, this reduces the windage cloud and returns oil to the pan quicker. Uh, by reducing the windage cloud, it also is good for a few horsepower. Now, I, I have never done an A to B test on the Subaru engine, but I've done on some other four cylinders and having a uh, windage tray has always given the power increase. It's usually like five or six wheel horsepower. Um, a Subaru engine has uh, worse of an oil control problem. You know, I would say it probably at least gives five horsepower and gives you better oil, more oil in the sump, less everywhere else, less spitting out your breathers. It's a win-win thing. Uh, finally, um, we're running the Killer Bee oil pump pickup. Um, now this solves like a number of bad EJ problems. EJs are infamous for the oil pump pickup fatiguing and braking, even on bone stock engines. Usually when this sucker snaps off, you lose all your oil pressure and there goes your whole motor. Um, the Killer Bee one is a lot thicker, a lot stronger. The bracing is a lot beefier. 
this guy's not going anywhere. Also, the tube has a little bit bigger ID, so um, you're less likely, you have less restriction and you're less likely to cavitate the oil pump. Uh, this thing is a mandatory thing for any, any belt Subaru. Heck, I mean, even for a stock Subaru, it's a, it's a good investment to protect your engine. I, I, I would do the pan and the windage tray and the oil pump pickup on any Subaru that's track driven, modified stock or not. If you'd like for us to build your engine, go to MotoIQ.com and fill out all your information and we'll get back to you. We can um, build whatever Subaru engine to any level you want. I hope you enjoyed this video on building Subaru engines. If you enjoyed this content, please subscribe to our YouTube channel. And if you wanted to read about this stuff in detail, go to MotoIQ.com and check it out. Till next time.